Hi friends, welcome back to 10 Minute Recaps. Today, I'm going to explain a mind-blowing psychological thriller film from 2008 titled, Pathology. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. The movie begins with Ted Gray, a brilliant pathologist, who enrolls at Metropolitan Medical University. He is greeted by Ben, a totally introverted person, who loves to show his new friend around, and is very passionate about his work. Ted is then introduced to Dr. Morris, who is an expert in finding the cause of death. He knows Ted's wife, and speaks warmly about her as if he has a crush on her. He then introduces him to Jake, an upcoming star among the pathologists. He expects them to get along well, as they both are quite arrogant by their attitudes. As the group of pathologists determine the cause of death of one of the bodies, Ted comes in and starts to tell his theory. At first he is ridiculed, but he shuts Griffin up with his Sigma mentality and effortlessly manages to prove that he is a mind to be reckoned with. On the way out, Griffin pushes him and tells him there is a problem between them. His group doesn't like Ted, but he smirks and says it's not a problem. The next day, Dr. Morris explains a difficult death as the body begins to shake and Ted disconnects the nerves of the body from his brain, which has momentarily forgotten that it is dead. Once again, a wonderful demonstration of his skill. As time goes on, Ted begins to take an interest in the creepy group who look like they enjoy dismembering corpses. With his stoic demeanor, Ted slowly begins to suck up to the infamous group, to the point where they even get the idea to include him in their little game. Jake invites the unsuspecting Ted to join their getaway that evening. At the bar they all have a drink and his colleague asks if they could kill anyone, who would they kill? Without hesitation, Ted says they are all full of it. Killing someone without motive is uncivilized, although he believes that people are animals and the only thing stopping them is their morality. Ted says that if he could get away with it, he would kill anyone, really anyone. The group looks at each other in silence, as if shocked or silently pleased by his answer. They have a few shots and Jake tells him to meet up with them tomorrow after office hours, but they are not done with tonight before then. Driving around under the influence is their kind of fun, do not do it. They stop at a sketchy place and the two are let in for 80 bucks. Ted is just floating around when his wife Gwen calls for the usual checkup and makes sure his Teddy stays in his pants. The next day, with a crushing headache, Ted and his group are introduced to their new body to determine his death. Ted recognizes the man from yesterday, it was the pimp they paid $80. He loses his stoic attitude and storms off, because he is sure Jake had something to do with it. The members of the group all come up with their theories about how the victim could have died, all looking at Jake. Ted intervenes and dismisses all the theories. He presents his own bizarre theory that the victim was poisoned and stabbed 18 times after 7 hours, backing it up with solid facts as he looks at Jake, who agrees with him. As their meeting comes to an end, Jake reminds Ted about tonight. After clinic hours, Ted meets with Jake and they go to the underground morgue where the body from today's session is on the table and Jake admits to killing the man. This is the sinister game he and his team are playing. They have to kill someone in an unusual way and the rest have to guess how the person did it. Ted finds this sickening, but Jake explains to him that this scum out of 6.5 million people in the city will not be missed. He thinks this intellectual challenge is exactly what Ted would jump at, the thrill of solving a mystery of how someone died. Ted still is not convinced, and Jake thinks he's wrong about him and tells him to get lost. He does, just before the rest of the group arrives for their game. Back home, Ted is upset by the revelation. He calls Jake and wonders how he knows he will not rat him out to the police. Jake took him to the brothel to plant physical evidence against him and would be the prime suspect and the second reason is that he thinks Ted feels the same way he does, he wants the thrill of the game. The next day, Dr. Morris tells Ted that his theory about the poisoning was wrong, but still interesting. After hours, Ted confronts Jake and tells him his new theory, which is even more bizarre, and Jake caves in, telling him that he is indeed good, it's right. But if he wants to keep playing the game, he has to bring something to the table. The next day, Jake's girlfriend Juliet confronts Ted about knowing about the game. She saw him that night and wants to know if he is in or out. He's still not sure, he doesn't know if he can kill someone. She hands him a case he might consider and walks away. It is the case of a family murderer who failed to kill himself. On the way home, a woman suffers a heart attack, but Ted stoically pays no attention and just walks out. He returns to the clinic, to the man who tried to end his own life and uses him as a ticket to the game, disguising his death as an accident. Later, he calls his wife and tells her he loves her and that everything is going well. The next day, Jake comforts Ted. It's not that he feels guilty, he's afraid of getting caught. It's paranoia. But tomorrow he'll wake up and realize nothing has changed. 
The fear will slowly dissipate and after a few days Ted will realize that no one knows he did it and then he will be a new man. That evening, everyone gathers in the game room in the dungeon. The game is exhilarating to everyone involved. Ted feels part of the whole, the community he has been longing for. They all get high and begin to dissect the body to determine the cause of death. Ted finally realizes how exciting the whole thing is. The next day, Juliet takes Ted to help her with her round in the game. She takes him to see a flabby man and tells Ted a story about him as if she knows him well. She admits that he forced himself on her when she was little and that she wants to make the world a better place, a place without him. He is her father. The flabby man is next one on the table. Jake quickly realizes this is not her style, it's too complicated a puzzle for Juliet. His lungs are jelly-like, but the rest of the organs are fine. They came to have a few beers with her father and admitted that she's a GP now and can legally prescribe him weed, which pleases him greatly. Ted hands him his first prescription and he doesn't hesitate to inhale it, freezing his lungs with liquid nitrogen and then smashing them. As their blood boils, they immediately get it on right there with some yoga exercises. The whole group determines the cause of death, but finds it hard to believe that Juliet could have enough strength to force the flabby man to inhale the nitrogen. Later, Jake confronts Ted and tells him not to get involved with others so they can find out who is the best. He also hopes she didn't tell him the whole my father forced himself on me story. Juliet's father is alive and well, he is the chairman of a prestigious bank. She faked her story to get Ted to help her. He then confronts her and orders her to stop messing with him. The group continues with their games, making their victims anyone who catches their eye. Using pills, or cigarettes, they incapacitate them and make them their plaything. The thrill that turns them on. They leave no evidence behind. Ben begins to notice Ted hanging around at night. He has observed this pattern of behavior in the other members of the group and suspects Ted is involved in something sinister. In time, Ted is impeccable with his conclusions and begins to irritate Jake. Dr. Morris confronts Ted about this. He is concerned about his extracurricular activities and thinks it is obvious that he is using drugs and that Jake is influencing him. Dr. Morris advises him to let it go, because he vouches that Ted is a brilliant doctor, and it would be a shame if he messed up. Over the weekend, Ted visits his fiancée at home, who notices that he is overworked. Later, she tells him that she has an early Christmas present for him, she's going back to the city with him, which puts him on edge. When they arrive at the apartment, Ted immediately starts looking around for panties that Juliet might have left behind. He cleans up a blood stain on one of the frames, but Gwen finds his pot and is furious, but he stoically acts like it's his friends and he's just keeping it for him. Gwen doesn't entirely buy it. They attend a party where Ted introduces the shy Ben, but then things suddenly take a turn when Jake waltzes in screaming like a turd. He acts like a stud infant in front of Ted and Gwen, making jokes about all the people Ted has killed. When they excuse themselves to go talk to Drive Morris, Juliet looks jealous of the two of them. Jake also loses his cool, feeling threatened by Ted's bizarre relationship with Juliet. Later that evening, Ted gets a call and tells Gwen he has to leave. She thinks it's his friend who's an addict and somehow, she's right. Ted goes to the basement room, where Jake is losing his grip on reality. It's just him there with a butcher knife. He puts the knife to his throat and vents his anger about Ted being a golden boy who takes everything away from him. To calm him down, Ted starts playing the game. He simply tells him how the three girls died and Jake feels like he is the center of attention, until Ted says he cannot see any genius in it, which ruins Jake's enthusiasm. After they clean up, Jake drives him back home, where Juliet is waiting for him in the lobby. He gets mad at her and tells her to keep an eye on her boyfriend, he just killed three people, but she is done with Jake. She wants him and Ted is having a hard time resisting her. Jake is still there and witnesses everything before he leaves. With his fiancée upstairs, Ted rejects Juliet. The next day, Ted tells Jake he's out, wanting nothing to do with it and threatening Jake when he mentions Gwen. However, he quickly apologizes, understanding that threatening a psychopath is not a good idea. Jake wants to meet in the game dungeon tomorrow and tells Ted he doesn't want to miss this one. Ted is on edge from Jake's words. As he goes home, the other members give him the evil eye for skipping the game tonight. In the game room, four of them decide to get rid of Juliet and Ted. When they all agree, Jake reveals that he has already taken care of one of them. Just as they are about to get high, Jake notices a gas leak and when one of them lights the lighter, the room blows up. Ted has set it all up, and after a quick look finally feels free of the psychos. The next day, Dr. Morris tells him about the incident and Ted acts clueless until he hears that there were only four bodies, counting Juliet. He breaks his cool for a moment and realizes that someone survived. He immediately calls his wife, but she doesn't hear the ringing, 
So he rushes to the apartment as a mysterious man rides up in the elevator and rings her doorbell. It's Jake. By the time Ted arrives, it's too late, Gwen is dead. Ted takes it upon himself to perform a full autopsy on his deceased love and later submits his report. As Ted works after hours, Jake knocks him out and ties his hands. He is furious that the cause of death is so wrong and cannot believe that little genius Ted was not so smart after all. He compares this to a sublime poem and Ted is his only critic who got it completely wrong. Jake claims victory anyway because he did one thing Ted cannot figure out, which makes Ted burst out laughing and tell him he faked the report, but he has a theory. When Gwen turned her back, he covered her mouth with ether-soaked cloth, but didn't let her lose consciousness. He then injected her with potassium under the armpit to preserve the body before dripping nitroglycerin under her tongue and letting her slowly slip away into the afterlife, which took about 7 minutes. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hit that like button if you did, subscribe if you're new. And at last, I'll say stay well, stay safe, thanks.